If you're just tuning in right now and you missed those first couple of hours with Jay Wives Sticks, go back and grab that sometime. That's cool. Uh, he was so much fun. I, he's like the nicest guy. For, uh, people often, I don't know why, but people often ask me, like, who's like the nicest rock star you've ever met? Because I've spent a few years in rock radio and top 40 and stuff, and he's always at the top of the list. It's just like, it was like, just meeting somebody from down on the corner in Chicago. He's like, hey, man, how's it going? Uh, all right, so uh, open lines, because we do not have too much time on our hands. We want to make each call count. So, you know, this is the night where those people who are uh, regularly heard on Coast to Coast get to kind of take a break and hear that next generation of callers, the people that are... You know, they probably may not even be able to get through on some of these other nights. Well, tonight's their night, so we'll do open lines. So we just ask everybody else to, that is a regular caller to sit back and enjoy what you're about to hear next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. So uh, tomorrow night on Coast to Coast, we turn toward a, a serious subject, meaning that there are people whose lives have been in the balance and continue to be as a result of junk science in the courtroom. Uh, And we'll have one of the leading proponents of the movement to even prevent people who are regular testifiers, you know, for cash, uh, from even calling it science. That's tomorrow night on Coast to Coast AM. Ross is on a wild card line in Minnesota to get us started for open lines on Coast to Coast. Ross? Yes, sir. All right. Where are you going to take us? Hey, I just want to say um, thank you for everything you guys do. Um, I always look up towards the stars and tune in this time of night. Good. Um, Where do you live in Minnesota, dude? Um, Scott County. Oh, sure. Yeah. Where in particular? Um, right outside of Prior Lake. Right mm-hmm. outside of Prior Lake. So you're kind of outside of the area where there's a lot of light pollution too. You're getting a clear exactly. look at the sky. Exactly. Yeah. I, I. Yep. No, and I always tune in. Um, I'm just wondering what your guys' favorite recipes or what you guys are doing right now. Um, hockey's right at, right around the corner too. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know. I'm geeked in hockey. Tom Danheiser is your expert, uh, of course. Uh, yes, all sir. of my predictions last year were wrong, but uh, I, I still find myself. I saw a guy walking across campus the other day, uh, Kansas State, wearing a uh, an old Minnesota North Stars jersey. No <laughs> I was way. Like, I thought that is so cool. And he said, yeah, he got it from his dad or something. I thought that was really neat. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so since it's open lines and it's just for fun, I will tell you that I I had to modify my diet, so I I stopped eating meat, uh, which is weird because I I you know I, it's not a moral thing. I'm not, but I have learned to really enjoy it, the w- one of the su- meat substitutes. The only one I like is called Impossible, and so I. I soak it with uh, with uh, Worcestershire or give it a good dose of Worcestershire, and it tastes very – so I use it in spaghetti sauces. I'll use it for a lot of things. How does that sound? Not bad at all. No, yeah. you, you keep dosing that thing, and oh, that sounds good. At, that sounds yeah. good. Bring in some yeah, onion yeah. powder. Give it some flavor. You know, uh, that's where I go with that. Thank you, Ross. Appreciate that. Mike is in Chicago. Which kind of started the whole conversation tonight uh, about retro radio, this uh, feature they do every year in Chicago about Chicago radio. But I was, I love the bands from that era. Uh, so, Mike, thanks for hanging on. You're on Coast to Coast AM. Yeah, hi, and uh, thanks for the program. It's, it kind of shocked me when you first mentioned you were having Jim on the show. I tried calling my two sisters right away. Uh, Jim and I grew up together on the same block in Chicago. <laughs> Great. Um, he Calumet play. is that where it was? It Calumet was he a Cal City guy or something? No, he was actually in Chicago. I, I don't know if you're familiar with Walcott Avenue. Yeah, I am. But we grew up on that same block for years as young kids. Um, I used to play football in his backyard with his uh, younger brother. 
Um, and you were saying what such a nice guy he was. Well, if you would have met his family, you would have realized that he had the greatest family. They were the nicest people, his parents and his other siblings he had. And uh, he used to play, um, his band would play for our block parties uh, for the last two years. We all lived together in the same block. So I was hoping to be able to get on, but I couldn't get oh, through funny. and say hi to him. Well, that's great. I love that. I'm glad you got through to me. That's a great story. And not surprising. You know, that's, that's kind of the, the nature of the, the fabric of, of uh, Chicago neighborhoods. So thanks for sharing that one. Marcy is in San Diego on coast to coast, west of the Rockies. Marcy? Hi. I wanted to tell about two different things I saw on TV about the paranormal that were mind-boggling. Sure. Many, many years before 9-11, uh, this little guy named Michael Moore, you know who that is? He's a little chubby blonde guy who used the, to do interviews. He said, uh, I'm going out to Arizona. I'm going to interview, interview this old uh, Indian chief. He has a, a prediction, and, uh, and uh, he was kind of laughing as he said it. He, okay, we're going out to Arizona now. So uh, the old Indian chief his prediction was uh, any of the tribe that have any relatives or know anybody in New York City to move out of New York City, not the state, just a city, because he had a vision of uh, massive fires and uh, ashes falling and explosions, hmm. and uh, everybody's going to die and uh uh, it must be, I don't know, maybe a nuclear holocaust. He wasn't quite sure. Hmm. So uh, so then uh, the next, uh, you know, Michael Moore says, oh, goodbye. So the next uh, scene, Michael Moore's on the uh, street in Manhattan, and he's got on a hard hat. And uh, he's on the payphone, and he calls uh, the old chief, and he says, hey, chief, everything's calm, calm uh, right now. Don't see any problem here now. And uh, so, you know, like it was a big belly laugh. And, well, it was it was kind of funny at the time, you know, the hard hat. Right. And, then the other, and then the other thing I saw on TV that was mind-boggling, they had a show, uh, just a 30-minute show, about people who remembered their past lives. So this one little boy kept talking about he was an actor in Hollywood, and uh, but, but you know, I, I thought he was going to say, "Well, I was Clark Gable, or I was." Right. Uh, but no, uh, he, he said he he had uh, he acted, but he wasn't all that famous. And he knew his name, what the name was. He knew the house where where the man lived, and uh, so uh, so they did research, and there was an actor by that name in like the 1940s. And uh, they showed some of his parts, uh, like bit parts, of, you know, with um, uh, maybe James Cagney or um, right, uh, uh, George so, so, Raft so, so, or whatever. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Right. So, so, so they showed they showed this particular actor uh, actually acting, and then the little boy took his parents to the house, and they researched it out, and they said, yes, this little house is where the actor lived. And then the other one uh, was this little girl that kept telling her parents, please take me to my children in Killarney. The hmm. children need me badly. I just, I've just got to get to the children in Killarney. And she never quit talking about it, and they wouldn't pay any attention to her. And finally, when she got grown, she got to go to Killarney, Ireland on her own, and she looked up these uh, elderly people this family that she she knew where they were and uh uh the the her, her children who were old said yes their mother died when they were young and it was a t terrible situation and uh, uh and they missed her so much and uh i i can't remember if this this young woman had cancer or what it was mm. But um, uh, well, those I want to I wanna ask you, where did you see the first one, especially? What was that on? Uh, 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 and, and now, this was on a long time before 9-11. But if you ask, uh, if you if you want to research that out, you could ask that Michael Moore. I, I assume he's still alive. And uh, Well, there's a famous documentarian named Michael Moore, you know, who was well known for his 
you know, polemical documentaries. I can't imagine that's him, but uh, the hard hat bit sounds like him. Um, yeah, so yeah. I'll, let me poke around. Uh, let's see whether somebody else uh, resonates with that on the phones and we, we uh, get a, uh, a ping back. Th- this Michael Moore was a, a kind of a fat guy, uh, a kind of a short, fat guy. And uh, I, I don't want to say, well, it was a little bit funny looking. But no, no, no. I, no. Blonde, I, I, kind think we, I think we're talking about the same guy. Yeah. Yeah. Blonde, blonde hair. But uh, that blonde hair is where yeah. you lose me. You lose me on the blonde hair, but you got me with the other thing. So let's see whether somebody else knows about him, and we'll pass that along to you in just a minute. Paul is in Columbia, Missouri, home of the Tigers on coast to coast. Paul? Yeah. Okay. I'm mad at the at, uh, University of Missouri and Columbia right now. Why that? Because they didn't—I have a crew— of my team at my station that calls the games, right? And tomorrow's the big game between K-State and Mizzou, and they denied us credentials. Oh, so that's, I, that's not I, good. I know. We had we had kids ready to go. We had it all planned out, ready, and they, and they kept saying, yeah, we'll work it out, we'll work it out. And as of Friday, we never heard back from them. So they apparently it's going to be such a big game tomorrow, like 83,000 or something is expected to this game. So they, they said, no, we don't have space for you. So I don't know. I think that's, I think that's cheap. But anyway, so you're calling from Columbia with uh, your it's open lines. What can I do for you? Um, yeah, the guy that was on earlier from Sticks. Um, yeah, I was wondering where his song "Madam Sweet Madam Blue" come from. Yeah, that was interesting. He told that story a little bit. So if you go back over and you can, you can hear that. That was a great era in American music, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. I think they were. One thing they were inspired by at one point was the band Kansas. Surprisingly. Yeah, that- yeah, they, yeah, because I've seen them twice in Washington, Missouri, Kansas, yeah, and they were good, put on a good tour. I bet they do. And yeah, Steve Walsh, good old Steve Walsh, uh, and Carrie Livgren, and yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, well, good. We'll we'll find out whether uh, we we get. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of other things that people want to talk about. But I'm glad you threw that in there. Uh, Blair is in Phoenix on coast to coast on a wild card line. Blair. Attempting to talk about my interactions with Journey since you had the stick members on. That was my personal experience. But I wanted to talk about emotional intelligence. Um, yep. What does that mean to you? Is it just purely semantics? No. Or um, I look at Christopher Hitchens, for example. He lambasts the Catholic Church, yet he you know, eventually dies of cancer, and yet you have Salman Rusty novel inspires the death sentence. Now, I have uh, opinions myself, but I want to hear what you would say, like in your class, Professor. Well, I don't, I don't see those as examples of what I would think of as emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence mostly uh, pertains to interpersonal communication, so not mass media or some sort of mass communication. Um, emotional intelligence refers to pretty much the difference between in a corporate structure um, or in a community structure, we'll even say, uh, how does one navigate through the emotional way that people react to news or react to things that you're saying? So that are you a good negotiator? So in one case, just to use, you know, JY from Sticks. That's why I kept asking him about how do you keep a band together, and it requires a high degree of emotional intelligence to be able to talk things out, sort things out, not just react. And in a corporate standpoint, they say that emotional intelligence, sometimes called EQ, is a better indicator of the success of a CEO. Than an IQ, you could have a very, very smart CEO who's a you know terrible administrator and doesn't make people feel good, or you can have a lesser intelligent CEO who has a high degree of emotional intelligence that can make people want to get behind them and do what they need to do. Now, how does that pertain to what you're thinking about? 
Well, I'm basically going back to what Christopher Hitchens did, and right. he basically was a gadfly muckraker supreme, yeah. you know, being an sure. atheist. He basically wasn't on either, on that side. And when he talked about Israel, Palestine, the two sides, he would say the parties of God have veto on it. On both sides would say that because of divine promises, when he puts in quote, made that this territory will never be peace. You know, and then you've got the side of Christianity where Jesus says, you know, forgive 490 times with 70 times 70. It's completely the opposite. So that's emotional intelligence to me. Uh, no, that, I think that's fair. I think it's emotional intelligence. So, you know, in Islam, for example, the the first response is to forgive, is to try to understand why this other person is doing it. Um, and I think that and I think that's a. I think that's a great practice. Um, Christopher Hitchens is a polemicist. He was a he was a guy who was a bomb thrower, right? That was his gig, yeah. and and so I don't know that. I mean, like I, I I never had any personal interaction with him. I never felt any way about it. I just know that when he got on, it, he felt like it was his job to stir the pot, and there's a place for that in society. And I, I think he started a lot of good conversations. Um, I was sorry to see him die so young. Uh, and I I wish he could still be here, still making his claims and, you know, being a, a, a troublemaker. You know, we, we have a tendency in our society, in every society, we, we like people a lot more when they're dead. <laughs> well, um <laughs> God provides, humanity divides, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, free will is okay. a bitch kind of a thing. And uh, Christopher Hitchens' weakness was, in my opinion, he was attacking just the organization of the religions. And the religions themselves were pure and unfiltered. Hinduism, Buddhism, the Islam, the purity of not having a form for your faith, you know, was advanced. So you had this Christianity forgiveness, you know, Judaism, right. the root of all of it. You know, you look at the commonalities of that, you know, like in part of Isaiah where he says, you know, my brethren is everybody, Syria, yeah. Egypt, and Israel, right. you know? Right. So, you know, I think you, you, you touch on something that I, like his one, like the thing that he's probably known for by a lot of people was how he t- attacked Mother Ter- Teresa. Yeah. And, and. He used her as a like the poster child of all that was wrong with the church or the Catholic Church or or the world. I, I think the problem with people who don't practice a high degree of emotional intelligence, whether it's interpersonal or mass media, is they put too fine a point on things, and so they're always trying to win on points, um, as though everything is a debate, and that's not how I think we. Ne- we negotiate life. And I think that's where Christopher Hitchens, I, I, a little bit of him went a long way. I kind of have the same thing with uh, uh, when I'm watching sports center, you know, there's certain people they have on, on, uh, or on ESPN. And I think, well, that's good. You know, they, that's, that's a hot take, you know, that was clever. And then other times it's like hot take after hot take after hot take. And like, oh, come on, you know, say something that substantive value, I think. But that's me. Uh, and so we'll get to more open lines coming up. You kind of see, you just never know. And we've got uh, lots of room for you. We'll give you the numbers next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. You never know where open lines are going to take us. Let's start with the uh, first time color line. Rick is in San, Di- San Antonio on Coast to Coast. Rick? Hey, how are you doing tonight? Good. You get to lead us back off for the segment. Yeah, I wanted to tell a story about when I saw sticks here in San Antonio in the early 80s. Yeah. Uh, so they were really jamming and shredding on this song. And Tommy Shaw kept running from one side of the stage to the other playing a double neck guitar. Right. And he's not. That guitar was bigger guy. than he was. The guitar yeah. is bigger than he is. Yeah. He's so. Uh, it looked huge, and it was cool watching him do that. But one time he ran across, and he slipped. Oh, no. And he fell on his butt and then oh. hit his head. Oh. And so the music stopped, and the band members and roadies, they all rushed to him. And, of course, the the crowd hushed, and everybody was standing up. 
And so after about a minute, they helped him up, and he went to the nearest mic and let out this scream like you wouldn't believe and held the guitar high up in his, oh, good. his arms like, let's yeah. go, let's rock. Right. And everybody just went crazy. Yeah, he is a showman. One of my favorite jokes from um, uh, from Spinal Tap, from This Is a Spinal Tap, is when the bass player, Derek, I can't remember the name of the scared. Um, has a double necked bass, and they're both four string basses. <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's no reason to have a double neck on a bass. I thought that was pretty hey, funny. Get, get he uh, does, or he did. Uh, no, I love that. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. It's a good way to get us going. Jim is in Normal, Illinois, on a wild card line on Coast to Coast. Jim? Hi. Hey. I, I wish sometimes you and I could get together and talk about the historical Jesus. I'm a retired pastor, 83 sure. years old, and I am extremely interested in historical yeah. Jesus studies. And yeah, I was just I just passed through Normal on the train. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, just uh, about 10 days ago. I was going up to Chicago. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's where a lot of the best scholarship is done, is is in that field. What about it interests you? Oh, I just think it's just so interesting to be honest about him. One yeah. thing we have to be honest about is that he was into apocalyptic thinking. Sure. And and that he was expecting the end to come soon. Right. And that would be John the Baptist, Jesus, the Apostle Paul, all the early Christians were expecting Jesus to return right away. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I think what's interesting about that to me is that that was a that was everywhere you know the, the the there was sort of the that belief that this is coming and we have that codified in the bible um and i think the mistake and maybe you want to disagree on this but i think the mistake for some people is they don't read that as historic material they read that as uh, was intended to be future material. Like we were, they were waiting for us now in the year 2023 to figure this out. They knew what they were saying and they knew why they were saying it. Right. And we're better off understanding what that meant. Right. They, they, they want to say, well, it, he, all these scriptures mean it's going to happen soon. It's going to happen soon. Well, we've been saying that for 2,000 years now, right. nearly 2,000 years. Exactly. And, you yeah. Know, the, 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 it's obvious. I mean, Paul was so convinced that it was going to happen. Soon. Jesus told his disciples, there are some standing here who will not experience death before you see the kingdom of God come with right. before you see the Son of Man come with right. the clouds of heaven. And uh, it didn't happen. And we need to be honest about that. Yeah. And they were kind of, it, it, so we, we would call that, and there's certain, you know, um, theological terms for it, but we could call that process afterward disconfirmation, where something that you believe absolutely is going to come. Then what? When, then what is the the what does the group do after that? Um, and I think this is a, a a great example of that. And I I really and w even when we're talking, and I'm sure Jim, you'll agree on this. Even when we're talking about the Gospel, Paul. Uh, well, which, where exactly, which one of the Pauline letters says that? Because that has a lot to do, too, with the emphasis that was put on that, because they weren't all equal, and they're not all verifiable in any means, well, which well, is part of that historicity. Yeah, yeah. yeah first Corinthians and uh, first Thess Corinthians are certainly considered to be letters right. ri really written yep. by Paul. Among and Galatians. Seven, there are about right. seven of them. Yeah, and, and about seven of them are considered to be definitely... Uh, penned by Paul, not by his right. Name. Yeah, so we call them Proto Pauline versus Deutero Pauline, and it's the Deutero Pauline that often gets quoted the most. It's like no, 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 no. We don't. Yeah. Well, I, that was good. Well, I appreciate that. Well, in, so in, in Corinthians, you know, he's saying that uh, Jesus is coming so soon that you might even consider not getting married anymore. Right. Or, and and what or what Paul was saying, which is, you might as well stay married. You know, the, the, there's no sense in you know, even if you come from different faith traditions, or that she's not a believer. Um, yeah, I mean, there, and, even, it's and, just, even it, and even if it's a bad marriage, uh, put up with it because he's coming soon. It's all right. made okay. It'll all be over. Yeah. And, right. and can you imagine if a young couple comes to me now and? Says, uh -huh. Uh, you yeah. want to get married? And, uh, oh, sure. No, no, don't do that. Why not? Well, Jesus is coming soon. 
Right. Even five years later, they come back and say, well, we could have started a family back then. Right. I mean, it, right. It doesn't work. And we need to be honest about mm. that. And a lot of evangelicals are not willing to be honest about it. And I'm not just... No, no, no. There's lots of people that, that just, they, they want this, it's the bottom line thinking that just says, you know, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it, but it all starts with the problem of what was it that the Bible, Bible was actually saying. Right. And that's, we, in you, if you say... Honest? Are we willing yeah. to be honest about I, that? Well, I enjoyed our honest conversation. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. It was great. Uh, let me go to uh, Hugo, who's in New York, east of the Rockies on Coast to Coast. It's open lines, Hugo. Hey, what's up, man? And I'm excited about getting through because it's like not only my first time call, but it's the first time I've heard Coast to Coast live. <laughs> oh, good. Um, Glad to have you. Yeah, yeah. I discovered it uh, through YouTube listening. Uh, I was binging on old Art Bell. Uh, oh, good. And sure. I got hooked. <laughs> it's what tasty. Yeah, yeah. What I wanted to ask you was because you seem so knowledgeable on rock music and you seem to have an extensive career. Uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of studios and venues. Have you heard or seen, been to any venue or studio that was considered haunted? Oh, that's a great question. Well, you know what? How old are you? I'm 32. Okay. So you may have bypassed this, but the first thing that comes to mind, it's not true, but where they recorded Love Roller Coaster um, from the Ohio players that you can hear a woman scream in the background, which was supposedly either she was being murdered or she saw a ghost and she screams really loudly in the back of the track. Uh, I've never been to a haunted um, recording studio that I can think of but that's a great question i have been in a few do you do you know of any no neither i've I've visited a few um there's one i was able to visit here cbs studio where how it's there yeah because i knew the accountant he would tell me there were stories that it was haunted that funny things would happen with the tapes and things like that but it was all hearsay to be honest with you nothing i've read online or anything like that that's really interesting you know what that's a whole that's like a whole genre that I've I've never fully yeah. explored that idea of the the paranormal recording studios yeah. um because there's so many classic ones and and so do any of the performers that played in Muscle Shoals or any of the people right. that played you know at, do, at, at Capitol Records or mm-hmm. do is are there ever any ghost stories on that I love that I would I did work at a haunted radio station it's kind of close okay. Yeah, oh, okay. um, that, that was in Davenport, Iowa, and it was. I never, I never, I didn't see anything, but there were lots of different things that happened, and people would come in, literally shaking, uh, because oh, wow. of what would happen. So that I believe oh, yeah. them, and so I believe the story by extension. Hugo, thank you for uh, getting us closer to the top of the hour. Well, then we'll reset the lines coming up, but it's open lines and Ron is in a place where I also used to live, Tennessee. Ron? Yes, sir. I, I sure appreciate Coast to Coast. I'm a longtime listener. Um, my son would have been 36 tomorrow. Uh-huh. And I've really had some connections with him since. I had surgery, and I passed away during uh-huh. the surgery twice. And I saw him, saw my mom. Mm. It was amazing. I'm writing about it actually. Good. I'm 63 years old, and I'm writing a book, and I'm trying to share that with the world. But I still appreciate um, James from Sticks. Yeah. He's one of my favorite artists. That song, Babe, that just resonates. It does it? Uh, oh, it's I, just awesome. I was never much of a ballad guy, but I want to talk about your son for a second because I just saw, you could look it up. Ann Thompson is one of the reporters for NBC. She does a lot of feech. And she's either doing a series on or she's, it was a one-off, but it was really good about the the experiences that people have um, in their, when they have a temporary, you know, a near-death experience. And what did they see? What did they remember? And about 40% of people who have a near-death experience, who are clinically dead on the table, 
um, have specific recollections. And there's a doctor, I can't remember which hospital, but if you look it up, Ann Thompson, NDE, or Ann Thompson, you know, afterlife images or something, you'll see that there's a doctor who's working on this and he's cataloging all of them. And that might be a very handy thing for him to either hear about. I don't know if there's something online mm-hmm. on him. I hadn't really. I just saw that story the other day. Um, I sure appreciate that. Yeah. But I, that's the kind of thing that they found. And it's almost never religious. Um, I think the, the, the images that people have are just like that. They're very familial. They're very comforting. And the one woman they talked to said that... <clears throat> The feeling she had was that she was coming home. Did you have that feeling? Oh, yes, definitely. I, I didn't want to come back. I've, I've actually been four times. I've had four of those experiences. Have you really? And um, I guess I'm Irish and Italian. I'm real hard. <laughs> You're fighting um, your way back. <laughs> I, so, I so appreciate you and taking the time well, thank to talk you. to me. Oh, that's good. Um, no, I look forward to thinking that your material might be included in that uh, in that research that they're doing. So take that seriously. Your experience is valid, and it, it's 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 forty percent of people. So it, you're not alone. Uh, Lonnie is in Washington State on Coast to Coast AM on a wild card line. Lonnie, hi Ian. Hey. Hi. Nice meeting you. And Anyhow. you. I, I would like to ask you a question. Since your early broadcasting days, would you happen to be familiar with a disc jockey, rather popular one, in Seattle, Washington, probably of the 70s, in 60s, late 60s, 70s, um, Lan Roberts of KJRAM? No, but it, but there's a there's a lot of people I know who came through that, and they would. Tell me about him. Yeah, well, well, Lan Roberts was a. They didn't have FM back then, okay? I'm 66 years old. Anyhow, they didn't have FM back in those days that I remember of. They just right. had AM. Sure. Uh huh. And 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 Lan Roberts was a very yeah popular, and and I'm pretty sure George would probably know of him. Um, but I happened to do when I was seven years old or six. I was at 6 o'clock a.m. My father would bring me to the radio station Mm. at 5 o'clock a.m., and I did the opening show with this high-pitched voice that, Good morning, Seattle. Well, lo and behold, mm, I'm just going to say, unbelievably, my, my, my second husband, who passed 13 years ago, anyway, was 18 years older than I was. All right. Well, when he was on his way to work, he told me this after we married. He said, when I was on my way to work, I heard you on that radio and huh. we ended up marrying. Funny. And he said that he cringed oh. because of my high-pitched little voice. And that's all I have to say. Uh, no, I love that story. And I don't know him by name, but... That's a really great example of uh, the, uh, Seattle was such a strong radio market uh, and KGR and some of these other stations are so legendary that I hope somebody does what they did in Chicago recently for the uh, retro radio and they pull up all these old clips so that people can hear maybe even you, um, you know, can hear. And there's a lot of them floating out there, which was uh, surprising. Uh, I was talking with uh, some of the people that put that on. Ted Smucker was the guy who worked on it in Chicago. And they just they just find stuff in people's archives. They don't I mean, there, there's like cassettes that people had saved or reel to reels that people had saved. And that's a lot of what they have. So who knows what's out there? Uh, cool story like that. Uh, and uh, and there's also another story about him. I'll get to that in just a second. But open lines coming up next. Uh, and we'll give you all the numbers you need to join the conversation on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett.